Right. Uh, so, in this lecture, we will touch upon some additional topics which I had left out uh, during the earlier lectures. We will cover up those things and uh, that should be what we uh, will have for the mid semester syllabus. So, under additional topics, I have the following uh, things to do. Namely, I will give you a glimpse of what is called constraint logic programming. Then I will talk about an area which is very important these days called iterative refinement search and just touch upon uh, memory bounded search and multi objective search. The last two topics are uh, to a large extent research work which was done in the institute here. I mean uh, memory bounded search was uh, part of PPC's PhD thesis and multi objective search was part of my PhD thesis. Okay, so, let us start with constraint logic programming. Constraint logic programming addresses to introduce the notion of constraints into the logic programming framework. And as you have seen that prologue allows you to have certain constraints like x greater than y, x less than y etcetera. But when you have numerical values and which are uninstantiated, then prologue tries to instantiate them by selectively starting with one number and keep on increasing that number. So, it will try instantiating for, for x equal to 1, x equal to 2, x equal to 3 like that. Hmm. What constraint logic programming is going is, is does is instead of having an instantiation uh, based approach, it maintains a constraint stack at the back end. So, every operation is pushing certain constraints into the stack. Each instantiation as we have in prologue is an constraint which is a equality constraint. So, when we are trying to say that x is equal to y, we are um, instantiating x with y, it is the constraint x equal to y that we are implying by that. When we replace x by 4, then it is x equal to 4 that we are using. But when it is x greater than y, it has to be the constant x greater than y that has to be pushed into the stack. So, in the back end, constraint logic programming is going to maintain such constraints in a stack. Whenever the constraint stack becomes inconsistent, that is the point where we backtrack okay? and then try out other mistakes. And finally, when we have finished the entire traversal and we have reached all solved nodes through some path where the constraint stack be, did not become inconsistent, then that represents a solution. And the solution is going to give for every variable the range within which the constraints are satisfied. So, it is going to give you ranges instead of actual values. It is going to tell you that if for these ranges the solution will hold. So, let me take a small example to demonstrate <coughs> constraint logic program. So, suppose we say that uh, if a person's weight is x, if the weight of a person is x, then we say that that person is fat if x is greater than 60 and x is less than 80. Hmm? We say that a person is obese if y is greater than 70 and y is less than say 100. And then we say we have two rules which defines what is proper. So, we want to say that a person is proper if that person is not obese, but fat. Hmm. How do we write this? That the person is not obese but fat. So, this is a case of negation 
as failure. So, we will first try obese and then cut fail, right. So, this is then fail. Sorry, Z. Right? Now, if we ask that is 65 proper, how is this going to work? It will try this one first and check whether obese 65 is true. When we go here, we find obese 65 is not true. So, therefore, we backtrack and try this one and we get fat 65. So, we try this one and yes, fat 65 is satisfied. So, therefore, it will say yes, it will say yes. Okay. If we try 75, what is it going to do? It is going to try this one first, obey 75, yes, obey 75 is true, it goes to cut, goes to fail, that means this whole thing and along with this pr proper also is discarded and it returns fail or no, right. But all this did not require anything of constraint logic programming. Suppose we ask proper x, now what is going to happen? This is going to try out this one first, right, and then we will have obese x. So, that is going to instantiate x greater than 70 and y uh, x less than 100, right. Then we have this cut and fail. So, it will have to infer that it is the range outside this that is going to take us here. So, when it is not this, so when is it not this? When x is less than 70 and x is greater than 100, then we will go here, right? And then we will succeed with this fat x provided x is greater than 60 and x is less than 80, right? Now, it is going to resolve these constraints. Now, here if we resolve these constraints, what are we going to have? I, 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 okay, okay. I, I wrote this right, right. So, x is x is greater than 60 and x is less than 70, right. So, what this is going to return is x should lie in the range of 60, 70. Now, this is the uh, power of constraint logic program. Uh, text please, text. So, what it actually returns is that it does all this, it maintains all this in the constraint stack and then reduces the constraints to the variable ranges. Now, there can be multiple sets of ranges, combinations of ranges for the solution, right. So, it is going to find that out and return it to you. Yeah. 
yes, if, if it cannot resolve the cut, then it has to actually take the negate of that range yes, and then deduce that what is going to be the case for the other piece. When am I going not going to go into this cut? It will deduce that and then use that as, as part of the constraint stack to go into the next one. So, as you can see that the reasoning that it has to do internally is non-trivial, right. But uh, there are uh, today's solvers that uh, accepts constraint logic programming. Okay. And further, there also has been research on how to integrate optimization into the logic programming framework. Can we represent optimization problems in logic programming? So far what we have seen is, we have seen constant satisfaction problems like 8 queens right, and other problems like quicksort etcetera solved in logic programming. With this, with constant logic programming you can solve several other problems, but you still cannot solve problems like TSP, you still cannot solve game playing problems because those will involve costs and we have to optimize cost. So, there has been recent research on uh, how to integrate optimization predicates, predicates which will involve an optimization criterion uh, and you have to solve the predicate in such a way that the cost is minimized. So, there has been some recent research, in fact part of it done by our group also on how to do this. Moving on to the second topic, we will look into uh, iterative refinement search. So, we go back to the, the search procedures as we were studying previously and have a look at iterative refinement search. So, what is iterative refinement search? In iterative refinement search, what we will do is, we will we have an optimization problems and this is good for those optimization problems where you do not have where every every point in your state space is a solution how can you have that kind of scenario take for example traveling salesperson problem so any permutation of the set of cities represents a tool right there is no other constraints, there is no other constraints. If you take a permutation of the set of cities, then that represents a 2. So, iterative refinement search is going to try to tweak around your permutations, so that your cost improves, right. So, we have a set of solutions. So, we start with some solutions and try to improve them progressively until we can improve no more, right. This is the basic philosophy of iterative refinement search. And these algorithms like simulated annealing and uh, genetic algorithms, they come under this category of iterative refinement search. Iterative refinement search can also come with constraints, which makes it more difficult. It could be the case that not all permutations are solutions. In that case, you will have to also check that iteratively we are also eliminating the constraints that are there. So, you have to keep satisfying the constraints and doing the iterate and the refinement, which is more difficult. So, we will first study how to do iterative refinement, uh, where every point in our state space is a solution. So, the objective is to improve the quality of solutions through search. Now, there is one way of looking at this thing, which is uh, quite useful. So, what we think is that we look at the solution space or the state space as a surface, as a landscape, right. And we are looking for, let us say, the minima, we want to minimize the cost. So, this is the set of solutions and this is the 
cost. So, this direction is the cost. Each of these points represents a solution. As I was saying that we are just moving in the solution space and for many problems this is quite easy to do. Right. Now, in TSP what, what could be the kind of operators that we use? Take any pair of cities, exchange them. So, your two current tour could be 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, right. So, I take any pair of cities and just exchange them. So, that will give me another tour 1, 2, 5, 3, 4. So, this is an operator which changes you from one solution to another and then you check whether the cost has gone down. So, if we are initially at this point and we suppose we say that we will apply the operators only when the cost goes down, right. Now, if we do this, will we solve TSP? We may not because you might end up in what is called a local minima. Whereas, what we are looking for is the global minima. Hmm. And you can get stuck in the local minima because exchanging a single pair may not be able to improve your solution quality beyond this point. So, if you reach a point where exchanging any pair is not increasing the quality of your solution, then you could be stuck in a local minima. So, there, there at that point of time, if you probably exchange more than one pair together, then you could have further brought the cost down. So, we have to see how do we get out of the local minima and ensure that we are in the global minima. So, the solution mechanism is very simple. We have some operators and those operators take us from one solution to another and the result of that those operators may in, in, increase the cost, it may decrease the cost, but we have to use them judiciously so that we are able to reach the global minima. Okay. How do we do that? So, there are Firstly, I will just look at two main approaches. These are two philosophies actually and then we will see that there are various categories of algorithms which use these philosophies. One is called hill climbing or gradient descent. That is what I was just now mentioning that if you keep on iteratively improving your solution, then that is called hill climbing if you are interested in the maxima and gradient descent if you are looking at the minima. And let me explain what is the philosophy of simulated annealing. You, you remember what is annealing? Hmm? You raise the temperature of the metal and then cool it down very slowly. I mean compared to that the other alternative is quenching where you bring down the temperature suddenly. right? And if you recall that if you do annealing, then the final structure to which the uh, metal stabilizes is much more stronger than what you get by quenching, right. So, this tells us that if you are actually trying to minimize the energy of the final configuration, then annealing is pr probably a better method where you reduce the temperature slowly. Simulated annealing derives from this basic philosophy and does exactly that. So, what we are going to do is we will define a thing called energy and the energy will be controlled by a parameter called temperature, right. This temperature is a parameter which is 
a random factor which will tell us when to apply a rule which an operator which increases the cost. Right? When the cost decreases, we will take it, but when the cost, when I try an operator and find that the cost is increasing, will I take that operator or not? And when in a higher temperature, I will take it more often, when in a lower temperature, I will be more conservative. So, the idea is that I have operators which can improve the cost, I have operators which can uh, make the cost worse. At a high temperature, I am going to use the ones which makes the cost worse also with a higher probability. And then slowly, I will bring the temperature down and as I bring the temperature down, the operators which make the cost worse will be used with less and less probability. When I reach temperature 0, I am only doing gradient descent. I am not using those operators which increase cost anymore. Right? Now, there is a nice analogy if you look at this surface here. Now, suppose I give you a ball right? and I ask you that can you sh keep shaking this landscape so that the ball settles down into the global minimum. Right? How can we do that? Now, think of the following algorithm. I will initially shake it really hard. Right? So, then the ball can jump from higher altitudes to lower altitudes and it can also jump out of lower altitudes into higher altitudes, because the shaking is vigorous. Right? and then slowly I reduce the vibration. So, there will be some point of time where it will be able to jump out of the local into the global, but not from the global into the local. So, there will always be a certain vibration which will be sufficient to jerk you out of this into this, but not enough to jerk you out of this into this. Right? So, that is the point where you are moving into the global minimum. And then if we do this very gradually, then we are certain that it will go into the global minimum. And also mathematically we have been able to establish that if your this reduction is very gradual, asymptotically spanning across infinite number of temperature cycles, then you will indeed converge on the global minimum. Right? Now, what should be this function? So, we need a function which helps us in computing the probability of applying the operator when the cost increases. Right? So, this again derives from the Boltzmann equation, uh, which actually uh, describes the temperature effect on the annealing procedure in the annealing of metals. Right? So, we will use the same function, people have used the same function and with good results. So, let us look at the algorithm now. Okay. Hill climbing or gradient descent we have already seen, uh, which monotonically improves the quality of the solution, but can settle in local minima. Okay, there is variants like random restart hill climbing. If you get stuck in a local optima, just randomly start from another point and do the same. And in simulated annealing, this is what we will do. So, we will take a parameter called the temperature. Initially, temperature is high. During iterative refinement, T is gradually reduced to 0. So, initialize T if t equal to 0, return the current state, that is when we are done. Otherwise, select a randomly selected successor of the current state and compute the energy, change in energy. What is the change in energy? It is the value of the next solution, where this operator would have taken us 
minus the value of the current solution. Now, if this is negative, that is where the cost has decreased, right. So, if it is negative, then the cost has decreased, then we will take it. If the cost has increased, which means that this delta is positive, then we have to do something about it. Now, depends on whether we are doing a, a minimization problem or a maximization problem. In for the other one, it will just be the opposite. Okay. So, here we are doing a maximization, right. So, if delta E is greater than 0, then set current equal to next, which means that if the cost increases, right, then we just select that move, because we are trying to maximize it. Otherwise, delta E is negative, otherwise delta E is negative. So, we set current equal to next with probability of E to the power of delta E by T. Recall that this delta E is negative. So, this value is actually between 0 and 1, yeah, because this delta E is negative. Okay. And we have biased it with the temperature. This is the Boltzmann function. So, we have biased it with this T. When T is very high, then you will see that this probability is higher. If T is 0, then this probability is 0 or asymptotically approaches 0, right. As limit T tends to 0, this is going to be 0. And then we will update T as per the schedule and go to step 2. So, see that the algorithm is very simple and it works really well for a whole lot of problems. You can try writing out something like the TSP with this formulation. You will see that it really comes down to very good solutions uh, quite rapidly. Huh. And you are guaranteed, however, of the optimal solution only if your temperature schedule is asymptotically uh, spanning across infinite uh, steps and with very little uh, change in the temperature in every cycle. Okay. Now, when you have uh, do any of you have an idea about what genetic algorithms are? You must have heard about genetic algorithms, yes or no? What we do in genetic algorithms is we have a set of, that is also another way of iterative refinement search. So, we have a set of solutions. We, we have at every point of time a set of solutions. This each solution is a string. Like for example, our uh, list of cities is a string. Okay. And then you can do a set of, the set of operators that you have are namely of, mainly of two types. One is called a crossover. A crossover would mean that if you have a string like this, uh, two strings like this, the crossover between these two strings would be that we cut this string at some place, this string at uh, that same place, right. And then this I will join with this to get another chromosome and I can take this with this to get another. So, this is the traditional crossover that we had studied in school when we studied genetics, right. And then there is also a mutation operator. And the mutation operator is one which allows you to simply take one string and mutate some parts of it, change some parts of it. Now, see if we did only crossover, then there was a possibility of getting stuck in local minima, because we would become very much dependent on the initial set of solutions. And you would not be able to get out of that initial set of solutions and go into different 
other types of solutions. Mutation uh, actually allows you to mutate the, the chromosome, so that you can also venture outside this. Now again, when you are doing with, when you are working with genetic algorithms, what are we doing? We have some cost which tells us the goodness of an individual chromosome as a solution. It also tells us the goodness of the whole set of solutions that we have at this point of time. So each step is performing some crossovers and mutations and checking whether the quality of solutions that we have has improved or not. Hmm? And as you can see that there are again the possibilities of getting stuck in local optima for the same reasons. Now, if we have a reasonably large population of solutions on which we are doing this uh, mutations, then it, it has been shown that even without doing the anything things like simulated annealing, if you keep on doing these crossovers and mutations, then you are likely to find a very good solution. Right. Now, the complete stochastic analysis of genetic algorithms is a very difficult thing to do. So, people have mostly studied genetic algorithms by empirically uh, dealing with uh, different problems and modeling them as genetic algorithms and seeing how they perform. And in many cases, they perform really well. So, that is why uh, this has become a reasonably important discipline of uh, search. There are some initial results like there is a th uh, theorem called schema theorem. Just take a note of it, the schema theorem, which gives you some initial results about when uh, genetic algorithms are likely to converge. But we are not going to go into the details of these theorems. Any questions up to this part? What is the probability? What is the probability? Okay. See, we need some distribution. We need some probability distribution to tell us that when we are going to select the next, uh, when we are going to select a move which increases the cost or decreases the cost or does. Uh, it makes the cost worse. If we only select op operations which improves our cost, then we will get stuck in local minima. So, we have to also choose operators which uh, will make the cost worse once in a while. With what probability do we choose that? So, this probability of choosing will follow some distribution. So, the distribution that we are choosing here is this, is this uh, e to the power of delta e by t. Actually, if delta e is uh, negative, then it is e to the power of minus delta e by t. This is the distribution that we are following. I think No, see, we are always interested in improving the cost. So, if your operator is improving the cost, just go ahead and take it. Hmm? Mm -hmm. No, no, this is a maximization problem. The, the algorithm is given for a maximization problem. So, if delta E is greater than 0, then it is improving your cost. That is because, that is because that once in a while you will also have to take moves which is going to make your cost worse. If you do not do that, if you conservatively just stick to the ones which are improving your cost, then you will get stuck in local minimum. Mm -hmm. At that, that time you have to spend because uh, if you do just uh, gradient descent or hill climbing, you are basically doing a greedy. 
and you know that all solution problems uh, you cannot solve with DD. So, therefore, you will have to spend more time in exploring other parts of the search space in order to ensure that you are reaching the global minimum, right. So, that is why uh, you have to try out those other things also, but the philosophy is that we want to do this trying out in such a way that we are eventually guaranteed of reaching the global minima hmm. and that is what I was explaining that you shake hard at the beginning and then slowly reduce it. So, that at some point of time you can escape out of the local minima, but cannot escape out of the global minima. Right. So, that is the idea. How would you know that you are in a local minima? How would you know? You can if you if you reach a local minima, you will find that none of your operators are improving the cost anymore. So, you have exhausted all operators and no matter which operator you apply now, your cost is not improving anymore. So, that indicates that you are in the uh, local minima, local or global you do not know, right. So, if you start shaking then, then your whole effort of coming down to this minima is lost, right. So, we keep the start doing the shaking vigorously at the beginning only and then slowly bring it down and you can you can think of this thing in, in, in reality. If I give you a, a thing and which has this kind of uh, surface and put a ball and then ask you to do this, you will see that it will actually go down into the local uh, into the global minima if you follow this, right. So, this is one thing that we know is going to take us to the global minima and mathematically also we have uh, proved that it will actually go into the global minima, right. But if you are solving a problem for which a suboptimal solution is fine, then just go ahead and uh, use a temperature schedule which is uh, quite fast. You can quench it, you do not need any link. You need any link only when your optimization requires very accurate solution. Most in most problems uh, that are very complex in nature, you will find that getting a reasonably good solution fast is not very difficult. The difficult thing is to improve it from that point to the actual op optimum. But in many cases also that is not important like in bioinformatics for example there are ma in many cases the exact optimization is not important because natural processes do not really care that much about the exact optimum. But there are problems also where you will fight for every inch of it, right. One example is when you are doing timing in chips, in VLSI chips, your every inch of it is valuable any uh, gap anywhere will prevent you from uh, going into the gigahertz speed. Now, you have these uh, processors increasing their chip every year, there is an enormous amount of effort which goes into optimizing the time. Okay. So, I will uh, we have little very little time. So, I will just uh, briefly touch upon some of the uh, memory bounded search strategies which uh, have come up. Now, the, the, the importance of memory bounded search strategies is because search algorithms like A star are not useful in practice because the size of open and close becomes so large that you cannot store it in main memory and that is going to really destroy the, uh, the, the performance of the algorithm. So, there are different approaches to do this. Now, we have already studied iterative depending A star, where 
we progressively increase the cost bound and per perform depth first branch and bound with that cutoff. Right. Now, the problem with iterative defining A star is that it uses two less memory. What is the memory that it uses? It uses only the, the currently uh, expanded path, right? And then it just backtracks and tries another path, etc. So there was uh, at the time when this algorithm came up, uh, this was proposed by Korf uh, and others. At the time when this algorithm came up. Uh, there was also the feeling that we need algorithms which given an amount of memory can utilize that memory and only do uh, you know remove parts of the memory if we need to. So, can we have a search algorithm which takes as a parameter a given amount of memory and then performs a style like search on that part of the memory. So, what is the important issue here? Important issue is when we run out of memory, suppose we are given a budget of m, if we have used up all of our memory m and we need more, then we have to remove some parts of the state space. We need to remove some part of what we have stored. So, assume that a star is, we are running a star with open closed etcetera and we have run out of memory. So, then there must be some part of open or closed whatever that we will discard. So, which part will we discard? And if we discard some part, we have to make sure that when that part, now the part that we have discarded may have to be regenerated again because we are discarding one part of the state space tree. So, suppose we have this part, currently we have stored this, this much and now I want to expand a node here. So, in order to create space, I will have to throw away something, right. Now, if I, which one will I throw away? So, I will throw away those parts which have the maximum cost, right. So, let us say that I have some node here which has the maximum cost. So, I throw that away. So, I throw say this part of the tree out. So, my new uh, thing that I am storing is everything except this part and then this part of the memory is utilized to expand this, right. But then there is a problem. See, we now have this node in the frontier. We had previously expanded it, okay. Now, what may happen is that if you if this part, the cost of this part again grows, then it may so happen that you discard this part now and then go and expand this one. And you can uh, go in cycles expanding the same portions of the state space repeatedly, right. So, what we need to do is to back up some cost from here back into the node. So, whatever we had seen here, pick up the most promising node on this frontier that we are discarding and back up its cost here. Now, so that when we are again picking this node up, then we will at least go beyond this point, right. When we are again picking up this node, we will be picking it up on the basis of the backed up cost right. So, until the we get a node which has at expand a node which has at least cost equal to the backed up cost, we are not going to stop right. So, that is the uh, addition that was done right. So, with that there was actually a family right, of algorithms which came up. And the first of this was M A star, which was proposed by PPC uh, in the early 90s, I think. So, the, the essential thing is that in 
To guarantee that the algorithm terminates, we need to back up the cost of the most promising leaf of the subtree being deleted at the root of that subtree. And many variants of this algorithm has been studied, among which recursive best first search, again proposed by Korf, is a linear space version of this algorithm. And then there has been many other improvements on whether we can progressively do iterative uh, depending from the frontier node and uh, what needs to back to be backed up where etcetera. So, all that has been done. Right. So, most of the existing algorithms that you will see that use variants of heuristic search and there are in fact a growing number of such algorithms because of the complexity of problems that we have in bioinformatics for example, where uh, MS star and its variants are being used to a large extent these days. Huh. So, the, they are all memory bounded search strategies, huh. A star in its, uh, uh, in its original form is not used in these cases. Just to touch upon what is multi objective search. Uh, so far, we have only considered cost functions which have only one uh, objective, but in reality, uh, we have more than one objective. For example, if you think of optimizing a circuit, then there are many parameters. You have area, you have delay, you have power, right. So, when you are synthesizing a circuit, you have to optimize all these parameters, right. So, there are two approaches to solving this problem. The classical approach was to combine the search criteria into a single scalar cost function. So, I say that okay, the cost that I want is area times delay square times power and I want to optimize this. Right. Now, this was fine at some point of time, but what is happening is that these days we cannot combine these anymore and the reason is that we do not know the nature of the solution space. So, if you look at the solution space as a three dimensional space, right, then you have solutions like this. Now, if you knew that if uh, by reducing the, if by uh, increasing the area slightly more, right, suppose this is my area, if I knew that if I increase this area slightly more from this solution to this, so the increase in area is slight, but that is going to give me so much of improvement in delay, then I would have chosen this solution. Right. But in another circuit, the sensitivity to area may not be so much. If you compromise that amount of area, then you might get a proportionate reduction in delay. Now, we do not know a priori that what is the nature of the solution space. So, what people do is called design space exploration. They try out a set of good solutions and they want to find out that what is the nature of the solution space? You want it back as a plot and then you try to see that which one you want for your particular this thing. Okay. Now, how do we find these? So, our objective has changed now. We have a problem where we have different dimensions, different cost functions for different dimensions and we want to find out a set of solutions which are non-dominated. Non-dominated means that a solution is dominated by another if it is worse in all the dimensions compared to the other. Right. So, we want the non inferior ones. So, it is the lower envelope of the solution space that we want. Hmm. How do we use extensions of heuristic search algorithms to find out that envelope? Right. So, what these search strategies does is that it adapts algorithms like A star, M A star, I D A star 
for solving multi criteria optimization problems, whether unlike the traditional approaches, we retain the individual dimensions. And uh, this is done by maintaining instead of a single scalar state space like the state vector we had, we will now have a vector which will de uh, define the state, which is the values in each of the components. Right? And it uses vector valued cost and heuristic functions. Right? So, this is basically the idea of doing this and the search strategies also become slightly different because of this and particularly interesting are game playing problems where you have multiple uh, uh, dimensions. Like in chess, it is very difficult to combine everything and say that this is the cost of this board position. It is very difficult to say that. There are positional criteria, there are tactical criteria, right. And then the same board position, two grandmasters will evaluate it differently, right. So, there, that is because they have separate set of yardsticks for measuring that. Hmm. So, when you have this kind of a structure, then you have to decide that among this, what should be the best moves that we have to take. Can we eliminate the moves which are anyway going to be worse, okay. So, we will not go into details of that. So, with this we come to the end of uh, the pre mid semester portion, okay. After mid semester we will study three other topics namely planning, then reasoning under uncertainty and learning. So, we are at the middle of the course right now. So, in the first part we have studied uh, some of the major parts of AI, namely the search algorithms which enable us to do problem solving and then deduction techniques or first order logic etcetera, which helps us to represent problems in a dec declarative way and solve them using deductive approaches. Now, there hereafter we will see several variants of these and specifically targeted to certain types of applications, right. So, what people have, see these are the two original things that were done in AI, namely the ability of doing automated problem solving and the ability to do deduction, right. And then when people actually wanted to apply these techniques to different problems, they found that these are too generic to handle uh, problems of very large complexity and of very specific types. So, people came up with different problem solving techniques specifically targeted towards those domains. So, the first area that we are going to study will come under the area of planning. So, planning is a category of problems which are essentially search problems, but we because they have certain specific features, we will model them in a different way and we will have dedicated algorithms for solving them. There are variants of such algorithms, but there are certain specific features of them. So, I in this particular topic, these are the things that we are going to do. Firstly, we will just have a small discussion on planning versus search. So, how does planning problems differ from generic search problems? Then we will look at three different uh, syntaxes for representing planning problems. So, these are not as powerful as first order logic, but they are good enough to represent the kind of problems that we have in planning. And then we will study some planning algorithms, specifically partial order planning, which is quite a, I mean which was developed several years ago and graph plan and sat plan, which are more recent techniques, which, we, which came up in the 90s, okay. But later on, there have been other planning systems where we have the ability to have negation there as well, right. And they will work in a slightly different way. They will use something called negation as failure. And the assumption will be that anything that you do not have in your knowledge base right now, so if you cannot deduce something, 
then you will assume that the negation of that is true, right. Hmm. That, that you can do provided you are working in a propositional domain because you do not have the decidability problem, right. How do we represent the plan? A plan will consist of a set of plan steps. Each step is one of the operators of the problem. I will give an example to uh, describe this in more detail. We have a set of step ordering constraints. Each ordering constraint is of the form SI precedes SJ indicating that SI must occur sometime before SJ, okay. We have a set of ordering constraint, okay. The, the reason that we will require this can be uh, more than one. One is that SI has something in its effect which is a precondition to SJ, right. And also we will have something that if there is some other action which will cause the precondition of SJ to disappear, then we have to do that either before SI or after SJ. Uh, so that is another kind of constraint that will come up, uh, right. But in the original version of scripts, it was not allowed, but ADL gives you quantified variables in code. So you can say there exists X at TX and at copy X, right. So you can use quantifiers also on the variables like this. This is more like first order logic. So you are trying to find out that whether there is a stall which will uh, sell both tea and coffee. I, I think I should have written the other way around at, at, at x t and at x coffee. I think. Anyway, goals are conjunctions but in ADL goals allow conjunctions as well as disjunctions. Right. So today we will conclude the lecture at this point of time. Huh. In the next class, I will start with the partial order planning algorithm. I briefly outline the algorithm through these examples, but we will see the algorithm in detail and then we will go into the other uh, planning algorithms, more recent algorithms like graph plan and sat plan.